Hello and welcome to the Brass Junkies. I am your host, Andrew Hitz, and I am joined by my former Boston Brass colleague, my current friend, mm. mentor, mentee. Wow. Uh, um, father figure, big brother, annoying Straight little out. brother, uh, kind of all wrapped into one package, Lance LaDuke. Lance, how are you? I feel like a package. <laughs> You look like you got hit in the face with a package. I did. <clears throat> I'm doing all right. I've got all my Christmas shopping done. I am uh, coming out the other end of a cold, which wasn't a terrible one, and trying to carve out time to do nothing, which is uh, find- I'm finding that more difficult than I wished I am. I just was. recorded and uploaded. I do for my Patreon patrons on The Entrepreneurial Musician, which, by the way, I just hit episode 200 on TPM. Hey, congratulations. Thank you. And the uh, the interview for that was Angela Beeching, who's the author of Beyond Talent. It's amazing. I don't care what you do. She talks about overcoming fear and about like goals, and it's it's unbelievable. It's really empowering. Yeah. But, she's a real deal. Yes, she's unbelievable. But uh, for the, I do an extra TEM every week for patrons, and I just one of the three things I talked about about the one that I just posted like an hour ago was uh, intentionally carving out space for you to do nothing because mm-hmm. most of us who are making a living as musicians have like you know twenty projects going, and that can kind of start to gnaw at you over the holidays. And it's like I'm I'm carving out a few days where I'm doing nothing, um, which yeah. is yeah, which is going to be really good. But like going on record as saying I'm doing nothing. So, which right. is, yeah, which is different than well, just not doing it. And I'm going to Africa, uh, which we, uh, I don't know if we talked about it. We don't need to dive too deeply, but the good news is I'm going to have almost no internet uh, for the whole time we're there. And yeah, I'm going to have a 12 hour flight followed by a three hour flight. So I'm hoping to just sort of sit and stare into the nothingness for right? great periods of time. Yeah, that's not so bad. So today's guest is. Patrick Sheridan. Woot. He is such a knucklehead, but we love him dearly. Mm -hmm. He is a dear friend of both of ours. And yeah, uh, yeah. I've known him a really long time, and Lance has known him significantly longer than that. So it's. I can't even remember. Yeah. Early 90s, whatever that was. It's great. Yeah. Now I was was like mid to late 90s. But uh, but yeah, it, it was great to have him back on. And he talked about a lot of stuff about how he what projects he says yes or no to. And, um, and he, he talked about Sam uh, at the end, like what for an extended period It is really good. I think you're going to really, yeah. really enjoy this. And it was actually kind of serious. The first one, I don't yeah. know if you remember the first time we interviewed him, the first 10 minutes was completely unhinged. Like, right. I didn't know if the episode was going to actually make it across the finish line or not. And then that one, like we corralled it, but this one started Okay. Was, my working theory was that we don't have to work for the crazy stuff. So I got to hit serious right? early. You did. You did. It was like right away. You were like <laughs> this like very specific, like insightful topic that you knew Pat would have an answer to. It was good. Anyway, so we are seven ratings shy of 200 on Apple Podcasts. Can you please help us get there by January 1st? Our goal is... This decade, we want to hit 200 ratings. If you leave a review, that would also be amazing. But if seven people or 17 or 70 people between now and January 1st could go to Apple Podcasts and just leave a rating, and uh, unless you're going to leave like a two-star rating, and then we would ask for you to wait until maybe 2022, since you won't still be listening, then you'll forget. But uh, we would love to get uh, a few more five-star ratings up there. It helps other people to find the podcast and... Also, a big thank you to all of our Patreon patrons. If you head to patreon.com slash the Brass Junkies, you can learn how to get bonus episodes with every guest, including with Patrick Sheridan, as uh, you are about to hear the, the week after every episode. Another bonus episode with that same guest uh, appears, and you have instant access to all of those past guests and past bonus. And there's a bunch of other podcasts, believe it or not, that we do. You can uh, find out all about that at uh, pedalnotemedia.com slash Patreon. Also, on December 28th at 9 p.m. Eastern, we are having a Patreon patron hang. How much fun was that first one, Lance? It was okay. <laughs> I had more fun than Lance, but I think he was... No, it was really fun. We had a dozen or so people on the call. Um, there were, there may or may not have been a, 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 a truck injury. 
uh, and or a heist. It's not yeah. clear which of those things was happening. Um, it was a hoot. It we was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, I think it was actually, it was more than a dozen. It was, uh, yeah, there were some people coming and going, but we were, we were on, it's on Zoom. We, it's all recorded if you can't make it. But uh, if you become a Patreon patron or if you already are one, which is uh, over a hundred of you, then uh, you can join us and ask us questions and ridicule us and, um, you know, make us laugh and hurt our feelings, which mm -hmm. I like to do simultaneously to people. So, uh, you still so have feelings? Hopefully we will. <laughs> hopefully we will see you on December 28th at 9 p.m. Eastern. So thank you very much to all of you for your support. And um, yeah, we, we actually remembered to read the spots during the interview. So without further ado, let us get to the conversation that we had with tuba superstar Patrick Sherry. Today on the Brass Junkies, we are joined by a tuba legend, and his name is Patrick Sheridan. Pat, how are you today? Excellent. Happy to be here to junkify with you two. You're <laughs> you liar. You're not happy to be here. I love. It's true. I just asked him as the words were leaving my mouth. I was like, "What? Why am I saying this?" I was trying to figure out what episode he was on before. I was like, "What episode are you on before?" And he said, "You mean the number?" <laughs> He was like dumbfounded, and he was like, "Yeah, I keep that right at the front of my brain." And uh, that's like the when I called the the vet yesterday to get a prescription refilled, and I wanted it to be sent to the pharmacy at Wegman's. And then the girl was like, "Okay, can you just confirm their phone number is five seven one? Just started off like like I would have my pharmacy's phone number memorized." And I just said, "I, I have no idea." <laughs> she was like, "I'm sure it'll be fine." <laughs> I was like, Anyway, so Patrick, how are you? I'm good. Things are good. I'm getting ready to, uh, I'm not sure when this is going to air, but I'm getting ready to fly to Chicago tomorrow for the Midwest Shiver Clinic. This I'm going to freeze. <laughs> gonna I be remember cold. being at a Midwest with you, actually, speaking of which, and you didn't bring it, you brought like a windbreaker, and you said <laughs> that um, cold was just a mental state. And that being yeah. cold was just a function of your mentality. And then we were out walking around. And then um, you're, let's just say that your theory was severely put to the test. <laughs> <laughs> and you questioned your life choices a couple of times. But I, I was younger then. I think uh, I'm more mentally capable now. Yeah, that's probably true, right? That's, a, like that's a what I was telling people. Like when they get it, when they we get in the Marine Band, right? We'd be outside and we'd be freezing at a funeral or some other outside service, right? Like a Pentagon arrival or a White House arrival, and you'd be chilly. And I would just look at the people that had been in the band as long as I had, like, man, you just gotta relax into it. You just gotta don't shiver. Just like let it let the cold come over you, and you'll be fine. And they'd look at me like, oh, okay. Like I'll eat a banana before I'm nervous. Yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> right it's one of those so anyway yes you're right i was still of that theory i'm not of that theory now that i don't have very much insulation left on my body <laughs> that's true yeah that's a good point and i don't know what the circumstances were i just remember getting chinese food with you and parent tony and another human but who that was name dropper is probably arnold jacobs up. or like john fletcher or yeah, it was definitely John Fletcher because he'd only been dead about ten years by then. So we probably would have eaten lunch with. I'd eat lunch with oh, him now. Us then. Pat, he was the <laughs> server. Pat's been dead inside for at least ten years. Oh God, absolutely. Oh, That's man. where all my inspiration comes from. <laughs> that dead place. So, <laughs> speaking of the Marine Ooh, Band, this which just got a little too real. So we had Susan Ryder on um, the last episode, well, episode one twenty six, as I have it in front of me, and we asked um, if. Because I think you guys didn't cross paths, and no, so I asked. Did not uh, uh, I asked that question, and she said uh, that that you did not overlap, but that she knew lots and lots of stories about you that your legend lived on, and I suspect still does. Yeah, uh, <laughs> at the advice of counsel, I declined to comment. <laughs> so, Patrick, what are you doing in Chicago at the Midwest Shiver Fest? Well, there's a couple, uh, couple of cool things. I'm this time. I think it's maybe our ninth, might even be our tenth year that we're playing out in front of the exhibits, and uh, I'm joining Harry Waters. Who's that? Yeah, these. Uh, I'm just a little known, Euphonium of small player. stature. Um, he's very wide in the hips, though. Um, uh, trombonist. 
used to play in uh, the Merchant Marines. And uh, <laughs> uh, I keep, I forgot, I'm, I've got to keep some uh, Easter eggs here. So I need to add Shiverfest and Wide in the Hips. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. it. That's it. So, um, Pat, I'm sure, Harry Waters. Pat, I'm sure you don't listen to this podcast because you've heard both Lance and I talk enough to last you 10 lifetimes, but you should look at the quote unquote show notes that Lance puts together every episode because all they are are Easter eggs. And it's like, it's good, like boiled down to its essence, Lance LaDuke jackassery uh, in okay. the form of allegedly helpful show notes. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. That's awesome. That's right. My first introduction to Lance Jack Astry yeah. was a scratch and sniff calendar. That's right. Those are collector's items now. <laughs> they are. Yeah. Well, it was, I mean, it, that, was, it, was, know, it was pictures of all the different various dismissed conductors of the Air Force Band. There, just to say. <laughs> okay. Which was hard to fit into a 12 month calendar. It, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. It took us there five we minutes. Go. So, game, set, <laughs> match. Hey, it's been nice following with you. <laughs> scratch and sniff okay now there you we're go. up to date yeah. all right um at the risk of this going um on the rails i want to ask you a question I, it occurred to me that i don't ask you serious like you and i for good lord how long 25 30, years 30, 30 years right why is it really why whatever it, it is yeah. serious now it's not well it's I'm I'm interested in a thing that I suspect you'll have a good interesting answer to. Um and that is how do you decide what projects to take on? Wait, that's an actually insightful. If you guys go like through this interview and it's all serious, I'm going to ask on air which one of you is dying. That's going to scare hey, the crap out of me. We'll just change well, the name of the podcast to the other one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it, and there's and it's impossible. It, it won't happen cuz pretty soon we'll end up talking about the last time we were together when we got thrown out of a restaurant. At at our age, I was really proud of the fact that we got tossed. <laughs> from a place but let's save that story that, that, that might be a bonus episode story it could be yeah, yeah. and our wives I, were there which made both of them uncomfortable maybe we'll just end the story oh i'm here for this point. there you go that's right but, we'll cover it later but it's over now yeah thanks for tuning True. in <laughs> yep so patrick how do you decide what do projects decide, to yeah. take on because it's I, hard you get you, you get overwhelmed, my, my prediction, my hunch, because uh, I know Andrew does and I know I do, you get overwhelmed with uh, opportunities to do stuff. And it's kind of interesting stuff. So how do you weed through it and, and vet that? How do you prioritize? I, I would say that that's a swinging pendulum moving hey, no. target. <laughs> um, Haley's Comet once in a lifetime. Uh, you know what I mean? It's, it, I, I, it, it, it goes back and forth between... Uh, um, projects that are like, oh, this is this is interesting, um, and do I is there a way that I can, you know, f- slot it into the things that you have to do to pay the bills? You know what I mean? And 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 the things that you have to do to create momentum. Um, I, that's the for me at this point. I'm I'm split between four things that really occupy my day and weeks. Part of it's conducting, part of it's playing, part of it's teaching, which is intertwined with um, publishing and or, you know, looking for places to put the pedagogy in terms of other people's publications and or ways to, you know, new things learned that change the pedagogy. I mean, I've got several people that have that bring me to their school biennially and they're but as they've you know known me 15 20 years they're like man you're saying the same things but it's a way different angle on it now than you used to have um and i think uh so folly is a large part of it in other words that's the beauty of being a general contractor which means unemployed um uh <laughs> which, which, which means which means entrepreneur hey, hey, right hey. that's that's an entre- entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. What does that mean? Don't have a regular job. Okay, great. Um, I'm a tenure track lackey. <laughs> yeah. Well, now you know. I got this great word that just means what people in New York City have been doing for the last hundred years: freelancing. <laughs> right. So now, now it's a course at a university. So, well, let me. Um, I'll let me attest. So I, I guess I didn't. I'm not sure. I actually answered the question. Well, I'm going to go refine ahead. it. Yeah. I'm going to refine it in a second. But I want to tell you that. Um, and I told you this when I saw you. 
uh, so we were together at, uh, in Ashland, Oregon last summer for the um, American Band College yep. thing. And so I got to watch you give talks that I've, it was what you said, like watch you give talks that I've seen you give uh, some version of in either a five minute or one hour or two hour venue f- dozens of times over the however long we've known each other. And this one for sure was um, distilled and um, <clears throat> refined, which, are, which of course are two words that always are used when you're talking about Patrick Sheridan. <laughs> Distilled. Um, distilled and refined, yeah. <laughs> the, the, in, in a way that I hadn't seen before, and it, it, it was it was definitely, you know, it was um, uh, <laughs> excuse me. It's a good thing you turn so, around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I know, I know. What the hell? Speaking of distilled this audio Just, recording and refined, <laughs> was, yeah, <clears throat> distilled and refined. Um, <clears throat> it was a matter of. Um, there was an effortlessness to it and a mastery of it in a way where um, I think all three of us are at times guilty of uh, winging it a little more than maybe we should sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Because totally. we can, because we can just talk our way out of anything and find something funny to latch onto and distract and uh, pay no attention to the asshole behind the curtain. Uh but there was this um, refinement, I think is a, a good word for it, in your presentation. And the, you, you had PowerPoint, too, which I'd never seen you use before. Um, and there was this distillation of these ideas and the sequence in which you delivered them that was really, really, really awesome. And I hate saying nice things about my friends in public, but it was really, I was really taken with that and it it stuck with me and uh, I was really, really impressed with it. So let me revise and let me refine and distill my question from before. And that question is, how are the ways in which you decide to take on projects different than they were 20 years ago? Hmm. Um, when I was taking on projects before, it was it was you know trying to climb the heap, trying to create momentum, so you could, you know, pay, afford your car and maybe have a mortgage and <clears throat> you know clothe your children and uh, stuff like that. You know, like so yeah. it was you know that kind of because there's not there wasn't uh, there there isn't I guess maybe slightly, but there really wasn't a roadmap of like okay, this is how you do it. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was, it was a wild west. Just yeah, I mean, completely wide open. Um, and uh, so, especially on the tuba. In other words, it was so uh, not explored that the idea had never entered my mind when I was in the Marine Band. I was like, now I have to go get a master's degree in something else so I can have a regular job because I don't want to. You know, I'm not going to go teach at a university, and I'm probably not going to play in an orchestra. So. I'm just going to be a weekend warrior with my tuba and, uh, and play, um, and be a jazzer and, you know, play in some, some bands and, uh, do some solo work where it happens and then just do something else with my, with my, you know, with my day. Um, because I, I, there, there wasn't any example that was hundred percent freelance. It was always folks doing the thing that I wanted to do, at least at that point, which was just play the tuba. Um, uh, outside of either, you know, playing in an orchestra, playing in a wind mm-hmm. band, teaching at a college, and a couple of guys playing in a brass quintet. So mm-hmm. it was... Well, uh, I remember, you know, talking to... Climbing. You. It was just, in other words, it was say yes to everything. You right. Know? And, uh, um, which is uh, interesting. This is fun, because uh, it's going to lead me to s- some of the news that I, that's going to already have happened when everybody hears this, but it's happening tomorrow. Oh, cool. um, and is Air Force related, which is even more interesting. Um, so, uh, uh, which is that, uh, you know, you're just trying to create mental, you say yes to everything. If you haven't done it before, the answer is yes. And then you just figure out how to yeah. do it. And it was usually it was call Sam right away. Like, hey, right. I said yes to this. What'd you say yes to? Oh, okay. Well, let's figure out how to do it. Yep. Um, and uh, I'll be right over. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm on your porch. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> 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 so uh and and it but it was it stems from the thing that we did on the the birthday uh uh, uh message that you sent out uh, on sam's birthday which i don't remember what number podcast that was or for which podcast that it what? was 
four. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. Don't be an asshole, Patrick. Well, it's just part of the, my body that I can't see that part of my body's tattoo. So it's tattooed there. I just can't see that part of my body, so I can't tell. Anyway, no, hold so, on, hold on. I have to interrupt that I asked uh, Pat for his address because we sent him a Pray for Yen's, um, uh, I think, apron and a Brass Junkies mug, and he sent back his address with the zip code plus the four extra digits. <laughs> Like, and I was wow. like, "What? Right?" I said, "What? What is? What's with the nine-digit zip code?" And he just wrote back, "I like to be thorough." So <laughs> yeah. it's not the craziest. It's not the craziest thing that I asked you. What you know? You're like Rain Man. So I was like, you know, there was a chance you were going to know the episode number, Mister <laughs> Zip Code Plus Four on a text message. It's like you, anyway. those definitely are not his underwear, right? <laughs> 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 but please, Patrick, continue. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it was say yes to everything, but uh, when that, on that b- birthday message to Sam, that thing was like, you know, we used to talk about Bernstein all the time, and he was like, you know, you shouldn't, you know, glorify him. You should just try to do all the things he did, and um, so that was a part of it too. In the beginning, which was like, I thought being a tuba soloist was going to be for me being a tuba soloist, and it ended up being a community band conductor and a writer and an arranger and a, um, a teacher and a, a, a publisher. Um, and, uh, a whole variety of different, uh, you know, things showed up. And for me, it's, that was, it was folly that led to that. In other words, sometimes it was opportunity. Hey, it was an Air Force band in mid-America calling. We're uh, interested in a, a, in a piece to feature our low brass ensemble. We're going to do it at Bands of America Summer Symposium in 2005. You guys uh, know somebody that should write this piece for us. Like it was Dave Hart time, right? He called, "Hey man, can you can name a composer that we should ask to like do this thing for three tubas and or two, two three euphoniums and two tubas?" There's a group called the Four Star Brass, which is super confusing because they were called the Four Star Brass and there were five people, so it automatically everybody thought that the fucking people in the low brass couldn't count. It's like what in the fuck? Uh, and Hart time was like, "Dude, it's four. You know, four stars is a general." I'm like, "I know. I was in the military, but everybody else is like, welcome the Four Star Brass and five low brass players stand up, and it's like, all right, thanks for the unwritten punchline. <laughs> which one's not a star? Exactly. That, that's, that's what I thought. Right. That's right. The dot, dot, dot. What, you know, I didn't see the ellipsis in the title of the group. So anyway, I, I think, uh, the, the, those, and we, you know, so I just said to Dave over the phone, I was like, well, Sam and I should write that. And Dave's like, have we ever written a piece for that and concert band before? And I was like, yeah, of course. Why? Why? (laughs) Of course I have. I have the whole catalog of pieces like that. What's your address? (laughs) Exactly. Would you like the nine digit code? (laughs) Anyway, so <laughs> so the uh, the uh, uh, the in the beginning it was say yes to everything, and then what ended up happening is that when it would get too busy in one area, in other words, right at the very beginning of my career, I, I my tuba soloing thing got super busy. I mean, I, I was like sometimes two hundred concerts in a year, yeah, it was um, crazy, and and be gone for three hundred days, easy. Um, mm. uh, and um, and I just it it. it it wasn't the happiest that I was that, that I, that I, and about my career. In other words, I was like, ah, oh, this is what I wanted. And now I got it. And I'm not sure I really want to do this all the time. Um, right. And uh, so folly led me down these other pathways of, you know, fo- sometimes it was the folly of like, yeah, I'd like to try that. Sometimes it was the folly of saying yes to a gig you shouldn't have said yes to. <laughs> and then, you know, growing through it on the other side to get to the other side of it. And then you, you've got a cool thing that happens. So, um, so let me tell you about the cool thing that happened. Um, uh, in other words, sometimes your, your projects are handed back to you years later. So you guys know that Sam and I did this, uh, sort of a cliff diving record called the big bottom band it was called the mm-hmm. record was called Rudu Voodoo. Yes. And, um, and it was two tubas and a drummer, right? The, the typical jazz trio. And, um, um, uh, and, uh, we improvised the entire record. Uh, right. and it was all done. Um, I think one piece had changes in it. Uh, that were written down. I think that one's called El Loco Motif um, and uh, Pause for Horse Laughter. Um, and then uh, the other one was uh, like a blues thing, you know, like a second line tune, but everything else was uh, like more like whose line is it anyway, you know, sort of just describe a scene, 
you know, hey man, and then in other words, like the first the title track, Rudu Voodoo, it's like Sam's like, you know, it's like the the shit of a kangaroo and you're under its vex. Let's play a piece about that. And we both picked up Didgeridoos and ten minutes later there was a piece of music there. Um so it was like, you know, small prompts that created large amount of, you know, right. like monkey spray painting happening. So I remember um, throwing like two dozen titles at you guys at one point too when you mm -hmm. i remember when you were getting ready to do that that meant nothing i wish i had that somewhere yeah rudu voodoo is a beautiful yeah that was the that ended up being the title track and then uh but like you know like one of them was he looked at me and he goes you know we should you know what we haven't played yet and i was like no sam what have we not played yet he goes a space viking mambo and that's like, right oh okay perfect and then that was it <laughs> that was the prompt for that track that's right that's right so oh, anyway God. so you know we we <laughs> I think Sam was like one of his favorite sort of genres of uh, uh, like literature and cinema and music um, was the, the 1950s crime drama, right? The, the black and white sort of uh, maybe even into the 60s too, like, you know, Perry Mason, but like, but, but more dramatized, you know, uh, Alfred Hitchcock sort of ideas, right? So, um, so the, we, we, he would always talked about, uh, one of his colleagues at a ASU as G nasty. Um, and, uh, so we would talk about G nasty because G nasty had a, he was very, uh, anal retentive. And, um, and if you, you know, like move stuff in his office, he would notice that the pencil had been rotated 12 <laughs> degrees and he would t turn it back. And, and so we were always talking about like, what a great private eye G nasty would have made. <laughs> Um, because he noticed everything. Like you could literally take like, you know, I mean, I'm talking about Gail Wilson, right? I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about. So we used to, he used to talk about Gene Assey all the time. Right. So it was hilarious. So like, and then you would like make grad students go down to Gail's office with like a little crumbs of dirt and then like set it in the corner and then wait in the middle of a lesson to see like how long before Gail would go get his little vacuum and go like, geez, man, these grad students, damn it. And then go vacuum up the Oh, oh, he froze. He private eye, he would be. So <laughs> I promise there's a point to this story. So anyway, so who cares? <laughs> so anyway, that would be once in a row. As a part of this recording on the Big Bottom Band record, he he's like, we should do a suite to Gene Nasty. And I was like, all right, so we're going to play out a crime drama. So oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The first moment's called the crime, right? This is the Chronicles of Gene Nasty, private eye. The first moment's called the crime. And uh, it's like this dirty, like, you know, blues, like, you know, lower Manhattan, 3 a.m. in the meat district kind of a thing where you meet somebody you don't want to meet and you're not going to get out of there alive. So that's the beginning. And so that movement was called the crime. Then in the middle, of course, Gene Assey's now on the case. So he's got to go out checking out what's going on. And of course, he meets the broad. So that was the, all we did. He's like, Sam's like, we're going to play a tango. It's going to be about the broad that Gene Assey meets. But the broad, we're not really sure if she's a good one or a bad one. So think of a size four beautiful woman in a size zero dress. Let's play a tango. Go. <laughs> so that's how that piece came out, right? And then the last movement was that Gene Asty, um, he solved a crime, but he ended up falling in love with the broad who happened to be um, the police chief's daughter. So the last movement was called Getting Caught. And we had done this whole recording and we hadn't really called the movements really anything. We just knew that we were sort of improvising on Gene Asty. And Clark Rigsby, the great sound engineer here in Arizona, said, you know what you guys haven't done yet as a field? You haven't done like some Peter Gunn theme. And we were already uh. in this 50s crime drama thing and so right away is this this motif comes out of both sam and i we start to improvise on this piece of music so um um which was you know nothing it was just like getting caught in other words it's like what's going to happen when the police chief catches the broad in bed with g nasty when they're doing the, the g nasty um and uh uh, and so that was the prompt for what ended up being like, I was probably more like 45 minutes of improvisation, which we cut down into like a 12 minute, 13 minute suite on this record. <laughs> okay. So that was 2004, um, and, uh, or 2003, something like that. We did the recording. And so now roll forward to the fall of 2004, maybe Christmas, 2004, Dave Hartung calls, right? Some Air Force Band of Mid-America. Hey, we need a piece. We want to feature the four-star brass out in front. Three euphoniums, two tubas. You guys know anybody? Yeah, how about us? Let me ask, let me ask the captain, Captain Don Schofield, who's now Colonel Don Schofield, the director of United States Air Force Band in Washington, D.C. And um, 
And uh, so he was like, uh, yeah, let, go ahead. Let him write it. Perfect. You know, it's a glow brass feature. Why not? Um, he didn't even ask if we, you know, if we had a degree in, you know, anything other than bullshitting. Right. So um, which we have seven doctorates in. And, yeah, uh, I was going to say <laughs> many honorary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, it's a minor written on Charmin, actually. Thank you. Um, so uh, the. Uh, <laughs> So we wrote the piece of music, right? And then, uh, and it was what we based it on this riff um, and this improvisation from Getting Caught, um, which was hilarious because it was this getting, it was this the theme for how we improvise was based on like, you know, people getting caught in bed. And then we're, we ended up using it as a riff for the United States Air Force. Um, anyway, so yeah, I know exactly. Right. So if you know that anyway, we don't even need to talk about that. So moving forward, um, uh, <laughs> everybody's diving under the desk at this moment. It's really nice to see this. Anyway, that's what Hitz looks like when he's shaking behind a piece of paper. <laughs> so, so, so we, we, we sort of crafted from that improvisation a piece of music for three euphoniums two tubas in and concert band which they recorded and they ended up calling the whole record to the edge of space which is what we called the piece of music uh-huh. and uh uh and then uh you know we got a chance to play that at a lot of places and so so did those guys they played it a whole bunch of places and um took it on tour and uh sam and i did it with the united states army band with three of the euphonium players from uh Pershing zone and uh when Tom Rotundi was the the commander of the band. And then uh, that was the year that we went down to ABA. So we were, you know, Gary Green was like, Hey man, we're going to do this piece with the, the, the frost wind ensemble at the American Bandmasters association thing. Boss and brass was going to, we were there and you guys were there. And so we were like, yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. So we asked Colonel Rotundi is like, Hey man, can we get those three euphonium players? Can you fly them down for the ABA convention? He's like, Oh yeah, totally. So we got to do this piece at the ABA convention, which was a really a, a corker, right? To play a funk piece of music at, at the American turtleneck convention. And, um, <laughs> um, and then, and then, and then uh, we got a chance to, uh, and so then they, they, the three euphonium players came down, and and it was and Gary conducted, and it was really great. We had a super time, and the reception was really great for the piece. And anyway, so it had a, it kind of had a nice little life, right? And uh, anybody asked for it, we just give it to them, and they, they can play it if they've got five low brass players that can that can swat through some of that those licks. It's like have at it. So. Anyway, roll forward. A week and a half ago, I get uh, a message from uh, Brooke Emery, who's one of the moderators and a clarinetist in the United States Air Force Band. And she's like, hey, uh, we're playing. We're the feature military band this year at Midwest. And I was like, oh, cool. And and we're wanting to, you know, Colonel Schofield wants to, you know, pay tribute to Sam at our concert. So we're going to play to the edge of space. And I was like, that's awesome. And Colonel Schofield asked if you wouldn't mind conducting the work on hey. both of the shows. And I was like, holy cow. <laughs> yeah. So so that's that's happening by the time everybody hears this will have happened. That's happening tomorrow night at both of the Air Force band concerts. That's fantastic. There you go. Yeah, you heard it here before social media heard it. So it was really, really, I mean, I was super humbled and uh, uh but it just like what a cool because the piece is really joyful and fun and funky and uh, and has a great backstory to it uh, and uh, and to to have it you know showcased at at Midwest is of course unbelievable. So speaking of unbelievable, of the top bands. So yeah, so that's that. So there. So that's uh, pretty cool. That's, I don't you don't even vet projects like that. You just continue to just say sure. Yeah, you know, I'll hold awesome. a stick in front of a funk piece and go. Mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. awesome. So speaking of yeah, unbelievable, thanks. anyway, I would like to uh, thank Parker Mouthpieces yeah. for providing the hosting for That's this unbelievable. unbelievable podcast, The Brass Junkies. Mm. Uh, wow. Parker Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, Ooh. trombone, euphonium, and tuba, yeah. including the Andrew Hitz Artist Model tuba mouthpiece and the Lance wow. LeDuc Model euphonium mouthpiece. What? You can find out more at parkermouthpieces.com or Their follow flavor. them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Twitter, Twitter. <laughs> maybe maybe Parker should start making batons. Or oh. wait a minute, Parker, if you're listening, you need to start making turtlenecks. Good idea. 
Actually, and just the turtleneck. So you turtleneck. can take a shirt and you can add a turtleneck to it. Or you don't even have to wear a shirt. You can just wear the turtleneck. Just the... <laughs> Turtle Dicky. That's it. Uh, Lance. Turtle Dicky. Whenever, whenever someone would ask what the dress was at some concert before Jeff Connor had the opportunity to uh, to answer, Lance would always say chrome jockstrap and antlers. Which and, is Pat's line. Which mm-hmm. is Pat's line. And yeah. so now it could be a chrome jockstrap antlers and just the turtleneck or just the neck. Turtle dicky. The turtle dicky <laughs> is the official term. Okay. Pat coined it. There we go. So it is written, so it shall be. There there we go. So can it's everyone wo- please it's woven out of it's woven out of shredded batons. Right. <laughs> Or and and uh, and then they use that they 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 take they take sage and old wind conducting degrees and they put them together and then they burn them and then the essence of that is the the smell that emanates from the neck. I was just gonna say, could we weave it from yeah from from doctorates of people who don't get conducting gigs afterwards? But that's mean. <laughs> Oh, at the advice of like, counsel, remind I me, to comment. That's it. So <laughs> remind me to tell a story about that same uh, ABA concert at the University of Miami for the bonus episode. I do. I think that's a better bonus episode story. All right. Yeah. That, episode. So there's two. That was a good. There are some bonus. There's bonus information from that convention that is. <laughs> yeah, is best left. Whatever happened to your life just now? Like something went dim. I know. There are so, I know. Thanks. Uh, it's great for the audience, Pat. Yeah, mention something that's happening that they're not going to see. Okay, great. Let's go over that again. <laughs> I was recording that ringing all the time. That's 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 not the plate in my head. It's actually the school across the street ringing their school bell. I was uh, <laughs> the plate in my head is a different vibration. <laughs> it's in G. I was recording an episode of the Jacobs Quotes podcast, which is a monthly podcast for uh, for patreon patrons of the brass junkies and i i always take two quotes from jacobs and then i um well i say less about them in three to four minutes than mr jacobs did in the 10 words that he actually said but i you know i expand on them and uh, and i actually mentioned the quote above i wasn't even reading either and i mentioned the quote above and then i was like i'm not there's no above you guys are listening what i'm losing my mind <laughs> and then i just hit stop and the and then I stopped and I just recorded it again. So it was like three and a half minutes and I was like, dude, come on. Um, anyway, um, so I actually want to get back to that last. We're not going to talk about this the whole time, but I want to get back to that last question. So so nowadays, I mean, you said like projects like that find you, but I'm assuming that there are projects that find you that you have to say no to. Like, so how do you figure out what you say yes to and what you say no to when they're not as obviously incredible as the one that you just mentioned? Sure. Of course. Um uh, I, I mean, it's starting to, the, the, there's enough momentum now. In other words, you, in the beginning of a career, you're trying to gain momentum. Then when there's momentum, then you can kind of like, okay, well, Curate. I'd like to, uh, exactly. I, these are the people I like to work with and they're calling again. So I'm definitely going to say yes to them. And these are the people that I don't like to work with and they're calling again. So I'm going to tell them I'm already booked. And these are the people that are, uh, that are new and they're calling and it's, similar to what I already have 10 of on the books for the year. So I'm going to tell them I'm busy and try to push it to the next year. Um, or it hits in a moment where it's like, Oh, thank goodness. I'm glad I'm, I need to buy peanut butter. I'm glad you called. Um, and, um, so, you know, it, it goes like that. I, the, the, at this point there, the, as you noticed in the sort of the, the vehemence or maybe the intensity of the things that I talked about at ABC, I think that part of that is just, you know, the 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 feeling of mortality. You know, uh, right. obviously in June, Sam's death was uh, on our on our minds. Um, but as are were are several of my friends who are battling with cancer now and other diseases. Um, and uh, but then also, you know on the precipice of my 51st birthday in July. So I'm not sure that the numbers mean anything, but it was just more of those like, okay, well, if you're going to make a move now, you better make a move because there's no, you don't make a move later on. It's like, and um, the energy was good. And so that the, right now I'm in that sort of space where it's like, okay, well, what are you going to do? Because there's quite a few things that are on my pet project list um, that don't pay anything uh, that I really want to do. And, I want to do them while I can still do them or while that, that part of the attention allows for them. In other words, like it doesn't matter that I have most, like most of my career is not playing the tuba now. 
most of my career is doing other things. It's just barely a third some years. And some years, like last year, it was almost exclusively being a sousaphone player as a bass player. And the, the number of solo dates was, was quite, was, was not very many, which was fine. Um, and uh, because there were other things that were paying like solo dates, like conducting and clinicking and things like that. Um, and then there are other years where there's 10 orchestra dates and uh, a couple of nice university band dates. And then I'm full for playing. I'm like, okay, that's enough. And then I leave the other dates open for, for doing other things, um, stick or teaching, um, and, uh, or sitting at home and writing music for my, for my community group or for clients. Um, and, uh, so that's the, the sort of where it, for me at this moment, it, there's, you know, wanting to come up with a next steps that sort of address what we've learned pedagogically in terms of using it in an ensemble setting, using it uh, for clearing headspace, which of course is great for practicing and performing. And then what we've learned from the folks that have used it because they were in a music ensemble that in the health and wellness arena or did things in the high performance athletic arena um, that, and they attributed their achievements anecdotally to things that they changed with their breathing that they learned from us. Um, and so, uh, those things are very front burner, how to end up <clears throat> getting some momentum to, to fund it and to how to, you know, put it out in the world for people to use, um, is the, just some of the little bit of the last steps. Um, so there's that, then there's a big pile of music I want to write, um, that, uh, inspiration, um, from the, uh, you know, so all the stuff I did with Sam, I mean, we improvised in a group together and it's funny now there's like Dan Buckfitch and, uh, Andrew, uh, getting his name. He's the director of bands at the university of New Hampshire. Andrew is a great writer. Um, ah, I can't think of his name anyway. Um, uh, there, there is a good composer. Uh, they're writing a piece of music together and, um, uh, and, uh, they're taking all these suggestions of motifs from high school kids from this band and, Oh. Uh, Dan's taken some of them, and Andrew's taken the other one. Andrew ahead, Boyson's last name. Grief. Um, and uh, hello, fifty one. And um, and so tell me about it. Yeah. Jeepers, Jeepers. Jeepers. And, uh, so um, who are you? Yeah. So anyway, we were doing this, but we were using the sort of this that we that both Sam and myself um, were were doing in terms of arranging and orchestrating, which is the sort of the craft side of composition. In other words, uh, the creative side is generating the the the, the melodies and the, the counter melodies and then the construction and what are you going to do harmonically. And then the craft side is then once you've made all those decisions and you've you know worked in the the the, the tunes um, is the craft part. In other words, like, Oh, we're going to do this here. And this is what the, the plan says to do here. And so that's just the craft of orchestrating after that. And so, um, that this, this group, the big bottom band, which actually started as dos amigos, um, um, was the, 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 the creative engine. In other words, getting together regularly to improvise, like when we would do a, the brass gym became a thing, um, that was codified. We'd always do what we call the jazz gym, which was just brass gym with way more wicked theory involved in it. And, um, uh, and then we would always end up just improvising, just playing. Somebody would say, Hey, let's try this. Hey, let's do this. Hey, have you thought about this before? No, let's play like that. Um, and, um, or we would play like ways to, to sort of get free, to loosen up. And, uh, then, um, we would end up writing projects like that. Like uh, the, the solo vehicle, we did two solo vehicles for me. Uh, one's called the Strait of Hormuz, the other, uh, which is this really cool uh, sectional piece that we wrote actually for, we premiered at Midwest with uh, Penn High School from Indiana in 2008, I think. And, uh, and then another one, which is a jazz concerto called Grappelling, which is a tribute to um, Django Reinhardt and Stefan yeah. Grappelli. Hmm. Um, and, um, you know, we those were, you know, like literally – sit down with a blank sheet of paper, make a timeline, write, write some words on that were some descriptive, some were um, harmony based, some were like, let's take, move the bridge here. And, um, and then, oh, well, you take that section and I'll take this section and then we'll, we'll get together and we'll start to, start to craft it. And then I would sit in front of finale and he'd, you know, 
look over my shoulder and music would, would happen and come together. And now it's, and then we submitted a couple of those things to a couple of the, the, the competitions, right? And they were like, wrote back and said, you're going to have to put one na- person's name on the, on the thing. There's, there's no way to compose with two people. And we we're like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's, there what are about, rules. what about what about five people like you know like you know it's just like right it's no that's called a jazz group that's not composition oh i see i see it's the other major <laughs> i forgot that must be printed in lemon juice on the back of my degree um so <laughs> we're a hyphenate <laughs> <laughs> anyway so that that was the the this this idea of uh, of so that 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 part of it. In other words, I've got uh, uh, years of this from both Sam and I improvising together, but also that's just kind of now how I reward myself. And I think Brian McWhorter, professor of uh, mm-hmm. trumpet at University of Oregon, calls it uh, slackness. Right, he, he practice is professional and it's serious. And then for his kids, it's like every five minutes that they would practice, he would reward them with fun five minutes of slackness, which was silly practice, which you could just do whatever the hell you wanted to do. You could blow in the other end of the trumpet, you know, you could be in fertilizer. I mean, it was whatever you wanted to do to sort of <laughs> performance art yourself, but it was silly practice. In other words, it was really just about expression, which always led to a big, huge pile of laughter. Um, and, um, and, uh, something creative sometimes would spawn from something like that, but it was this idea of connecting joy to the act of making music without it always being, you know, hammer nails and go to work. Um, and, uh, um, and I, I, I talked about that. All. I think I might've talked about it this summer, this idea of play. That's the verb we use when we talk about right. music. We don't talk about we, that. We work Wagner. We, we, we play music. It's always my private delight on the airplane. Hey, what do you do for a living? And everybody says the same thing. They, they work in a place like a hospital. I work in a hospital. Oh, what do you do? Oh, I work in this field. Or they work in a field, right? Oh, I'm a lawyer. I'm an accountant. And, and then like, oh, where do you work? And that's the verb we use. And they're like, well, what do you do? Oh, I'm a musician. And the next thing they say is, what do you play? And I'm always like in my head laughing my ass off. I'm like, oh, I love that you use the word play. You got to work. Ha ha. Um, and uh, I get to play for a living. That's what I do. Um, but it's like we don't – it's it's such an intense business. It's so competitive. Whether you do it um, vocationally like we do, whether you do it aspirationally like so many people do, which is where they got to find the time in their day to practice a little bit so they can make their contribution to whatever group that they're playing in or whatever choir they sing in um, so that their soul gets fed the way it needs to get fed, that debits and credits or – case law or whatever it is, is not filling for them. And, um, that, uh, it's, it, it doesn't feel like that we take enough of a chance to think about that. It's play. It's like little kids. Mm-hmm. And, and then when little kids are playing, there aren't any rules, right? It's not like some guy in the backyard with a clipboard going like, no, 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 move that grain of sand to the left. Unless they have already, unless they already play euphonium. And then that's a different oh, thing. It's true. <laughs> so can I use but, an alternate yeah. fingering on that? <laughs> this is the, just, at the advice of counsel I declined to comment the sixth parcel right. which yeah. is naturally flat right. <laughs> right. The, I, so, I mean that's always felt like like the greatest probably the greatest number of people that played the bassoon were proctologists because both <laughs> professions require you to be able to put your thumb in more than ten places so hey that's pretty good jeez oh, <laughs> that's yours when we Oh, you should, be. you should email email <laughs> Pat. Enough. Yeah, email Pat, not us. Uh, <laughs> I'll just write bassoons and thumbs. Yes, <laughs> you can email me at Jens Lindemann at ucla.edu. I might answer all my emails there. Speaking <laughs> speaking of uh, bassoons, Lance, uh, should you uh, tell the beautiful people about the Pappert people? I would love to talk about the Pappert people. There's a link in the show notes below my beautiful and illuminating show notes that will take you to a page <laughs> devoted you, to the programs wait, and tutelage you can hold get. On. You paused before yeah. show notes so long that it was like it was like a mad lib. It was like the, <laughs> my beautiful and whatever whatever you said inspirational Oh we should totally do these notes. as Mad Libs soon. Right. <laughs> wait, Mad Libs, hold on. Wait while I unscramble this. Hey. <laughs> mad Libs. Oh this is great. Anyway, if you click on that link in the Show notes below. You will find a page that will tell you everything you need to know about what's going on at the Duquesne University Mary Papert School of Music. 
Um, they have been a long-standing supporter of the show, and I would like to take this opportunity to express my deep, unrelenting, unceasing thanks for Jim. <laughs> Jim. Uncomfortable pause. <laughs> Nova. What's he? For me, making, making this possible. For? The camera, oh. the, this phone fell over, so we're looking at his <laughs> ceiling. We're looking at the lights. Oh boy, it's fantastic. Oh, sorry, it's all right. No, it was worth it. Oh. So thank you, Jim. Um, uncomfortable for that. pause, Nova. I like it. <laughs> that is spectacular. His wife uh, runs one of the youth orchestras here in Pittsburgh, <laughs> and I conducted the Brass Roots on Friday. She played horn. I hadn't had the opportunity to hear her. She's a fantastic horn player, man. Really, really uh, great player. So that was fun. Way go. more What's talented. The, than, uh, the Brass Roots. Pausa. Pausa. The Brass Roots. Yep. Pausa. Cesura. <laughs> oh, uh, speaking <laughs> speaking of the Brass Roots, um, I would like to. Th- there is a, there's a few levels of funny here. So Lance has a former student whose name is Abby Lannon. Who Abby is a total badass. Um, oh, yeah. She she does some work for uh, for Petalote Media. Uh, and uh, I was going to try and have a phone call with her today, but uh, not in a bad way, but today has just gone completely sideways. So I texted her and said, I don't think I'm going to be able to talk today. She said, no worries. And then I took a quick sh- screenshot of uh, the two of you beautiful people and said, right now. And then she wrote, icons. <laughs> and then I wrote, <laughs> I wrote, I think without a hint of irony. And then I wrote back, this is while we were talking. I then wrote, I just see two of my jackass buddies. And then this is the part where there are some layers here. <laughs> she said, is it wrong of me to say that Pat just looks like a slightly older, more fashionable Lance in this image? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's, older there's, i know I that's know. my favorite part that's why that's why i said that there's some layers to this because because pat is younger but she called you more fashionable so she unintentionally insulted both of you which is awesome and then i wrote oh no, she intentionally insulted me she oh, unintentionally yeah. insulted pat and then i wrote okay this is going on the air in a minute uh, laughing my ass off. She wrote, oh no, Lance just let me borrow his trombone too. That's now right. I'm in trouble. And then I said he hasn't used it in years. And then also she said true. he'd obviously just take it away out of spite. So that's that's pretty funny right there. <laughs> Abby Lana needs to return Lance's <laughs> and Show notes. That is, it. that is spectacular. That's pretty funny. So, um, so <laughs> let well, this has been a this has been like a bizarrely serious episode. Um, and it's we awesome. I've answered none of your questions. Too. Well, That's no, you've, you've you've answered it's nice them. Nice chatting a, with you, though. Well, <laughs> well, at your advanced age, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you are you since <laughs> when you're young like me, <laughs> you don't have these problems. You have to make a choice. You either got to know it all or you got to look good. So yeah, I'm gonna go right. fashionable. Yeah, I'm I mean, go fashionable. And I guess in his defense, I'm rather. Too. In in Pat's defense, rather than preparing for this interview, he was yeah he was busy looking in the mirror, just making sure he looked good for this audio only podcast. Ow. The uh, so so Pat, uh, let's uh, if you don't mind talk where where are you right now with uh, with the Sam thing? Like he's been gone for a while now. You know we're recording this in December, so he has been gone for uh, what eight almost eight and a half months. But like where where are you with that whole process? I'm not sure what do you mean by that question, but I, 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 I'll, let me just tell you what I, the interesting part of what, I, because I'm so thick and I didn't expect this to happen. So, you know, he passed away on, in April and uh, I just figured that, you know, everybody would, would mourn by themselves or with each other or like with his family. Right. Um, and I'm an idiot. I only have four vowels. Um, I don't, I don't, they don't let me play F tuba with like nine vowels and I don't have any graduate degrees in music. So I didn't expect, uh, that with the person that they knew, uh, or at least saw a lot with Sam, which is me. So that was, uh, I didn't expect that. So I was really probably mid July where I was talking to some of my friends uh, and they're like, you probably haven't had any space to grieve yet. And I'm like, no, I, I haven't actually. I've hmm. not. There hasn't been enough room to do that hmm. yet. Um, there, there's just been, 
you know, really being there for other people, um, which of course has been was has been great because there have been a lot of people that who were a part of the Sam uh, legacy. There's all the stories I knew from hanging out with him for so long that I'd never met before or had only met in passing right. or briefly that uh, I ended up, you know, having great email exchanges or conversations with either in person or over the telephone. So the, the, that was, that's been this really very awesome thing, which is, I, I stated before for you guys. Um, the, uh, so then anyway, um, part of being doing what we do and our schedules as musicians are very entwined with the academic calendar and the academic calendar is intertwined with the professional music calendar. So there's always a dead space, right? Late August to early, and early September where like hardly anybody works during that time. And I don't I hardly ever work then. And um, so annually since Michelle and I 2011 and we became vegan and mostly vegan in 2012. Um, and uh, uh, so um, I do a fast in the fall. Uh, I always have been doing sometimes intermittent fasting, but mostly juice fasting. And I can get it started in late August because I'm home. I, uh, I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do another fast this fall. And, uh, so anyway, that's you're like, what the hell does this have to do with Sam? Um, but, uh, um, I can look on your face. It's, no. it's beautiful. No. Well, when I asked the question, I knew you were gonna have an answer, but when you said, I'm not sure what you mean by that question, I was like, well, I don't either. So you need to figure it out. So, and, and now you're yeah, talking uh, about like juice fasting, which is like, you know, it's, it's the, right. it's the pat Working show. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's fine. It's, it's, it's all the way around. Well, I, I talk in Pano, so I got to work my way all the way around to get to the point. Right. I talk right. in Pano. <laughs> it's like my haircut, right? <laughs> so. You talk in fashionable Pano. Well, sorry. My hairline, uh, hold on. My hairline is a pano, so I don't want to. I don't want to misquote Abby. She did not call you fashionable. She called you slightly more fashionable than Lance, which are oh, those are no. two okay. very different things. <laughs> oh no. Anyway, I'm I sorry. Like saying Mo was the smart stooge. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what that's I was it. getting at. Yes. <laughs> it's fine. I'll take it. I'll take it. So, all right. So, so juice fast. Uh, anyway, so so the, so anyway, but the thing that I noticed the most about this, like years ago when I started fasting, and I've done maybe fifteen or twenty fasts since then, is that besides the obvious nice rejuvenation and you, your, your digestive system goes to sleep, so your parasympathetic system has way more energy for 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 every other function in your body, is that there's a headspace to fasting that is really incredible. Um, there's a clarity of thought. Um, that's awesome. And there's a, also a quiet that accompanies not eating. Um, that is, uh, something that my brain doesn't ever, hardly ever, ever get until like the day nine or 10 of a vacation in the woods, you know, and, um, and fasting puts my head in that space. So the amount of, uh, all kinds of things, uh, that I needed to process about, uh, I knew that I needed the headspace of a fast to be able to do the processing, hmm. if that makes any sense. So I had planned in the middle of July when I was talking to some of my buddies, like, oh, you haven't really. No, I haven't. I haven't had time. I haven't had any space to do that, that the fast that I was going to do in August, uh, the one where I would, you know, the, the main intention of the fast was going to be to grieve for Sam. And then the other one, because the other part about fasting, which is an odd thing, is that there's an explosion of energy that comes from not eating, which is weird. Um, that and that you know, there's. I, I don't want to get into creed, but there are things that I believe in, and one of them is energy. So I was like, you know, a couple you, of my buddies are. I thought you are, meant the crappy suffering. rock band Creed. I was like, boy, this the bad is bad rock band. Yeah, <laughs> can't we talk about no, Nickelback? Oh man. Can we talk- <laughs> I like the backs of dimes better. Oh. Anyway, so um, <laughs> said one euphonium player to the other, looking at an alternative fingering chart. Um, They've never it, seen that much money. <laughs> 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 this should have been our plan all along, Lance. We should have asked him about the, about processing <laughs> Sam's death and then not let him answer for the full hour. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been ten percent of our audience would have called it the greatest episode of the Brass Junkies ever, and then we would have lost like half our Patreon patrons. Also, those both would have happened. <laughs> so I'm sorry, Pat. Please, please tell us about your feelings and working through them. No. We, we care. 
<laughs> creed. <laughs> creed. Energy. So my so my creed, my energy <laughs> are. Uh, I would like to speak to you about no. my energy chakras. <laughs> But first, let's breathe. Yeah. <laughs> breathe. Breathe. Oh. And breathe from your oh. diaphragm. Yeah, I was just about to say that. Yeah. Wait, oh. let me get mine. Belly okay, now. Belly breathing. Oh, I have a good story for the oh. bonus episode also. But, Pat, the funny thing is, we keep interrupting. I actually do legitimately want to hear your answer, but I'm incapable of not talking. Okay. <laughs> Please, can, I actually mean this. Continue. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause for, so that Lance can type show notes. <laughs> anyway, Creed um, versus Nickelback. <laughs> exactly. I was already way ahead of you. Now I just typed show notes into the show notes. <laughs> Uh, uh, I had planned to, to sort of, uh, you know, two intentions for the fast. One was to give myself some headspace to grieve Sam. And the other one was, uh, to offer up some, you know, some energy and, and, uh, to two of my buddies that were, that are suffering, that are, you know, fighting for life. So, um, so I started in uh, the middle of August and, uh, 60 days in my fast um, this time it started off as a juice fast, and then it turned into a, just a supplements in the morning, noon, and evening, and water, about almost two gallons a day. So I ended up fasting out to 60 days, which was the middle of October, and um, I think it was right about the time, I actually, I talked to you guys, actually, for Sam's birthday, and uh, I just got, you know, I got out of the shower, looked in the mirror, and I was like, well, what's my body been doing for energy? Well, it's been taking the fat off my body, so... And I can still see energy hanging from my body. So I guess I'm going to continue to fast. So uh, I, I ate on Thanksgiving. So I fasted for 100 days. And, uh, uh, and it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was amazing. It was, I mean, you know, you can, you can see the difference. Yeah. But that's the part. The, the, the bonus is the, was the, the, the enough headspace to do kind of grieving. And it was not, it's not like, you know, sob with Kleenex grieving. It's like process all kinds of feelings that are, a feel, sense of loss, but all kinds of other ones too. Because you, when you work together with somebody for a really long time, and you own a business together for a long time, this you know you see you both see the whole spectrum of all of each other's behaviors, and uh, so there was lots of lots to go through, and mm. uh, so yeah, so it was good. It was a really good fall. I think the best thing that was really nice was to see at Wibic, which was seven ninety eight ninety nine of the fast. Uh, up in Seattle and see uh, uh, Jose and Domingo were both like, oh my God, you're, you're glowing. How are you? And I'm like, I'm really much better. I'm much better. Thank you. I'm feeling way better. Because we were all mm-hmm. pretty bunched up in June at, in, when we were hanging out at the memorial, right? Yep. Good time. We all had the good, lots of cathartic laughter, but <clears throat> we were all in process for sure. Yep. And, uh, yeah, that was an intense so, flight home. Yeah, yeah, totally. I'm sure. So, so I'm. Thank you for asking. I'm doing. I'm doing great. Um, feeling really, really, really good. And um, uh, and the, the, that's the sort of the, the nice part of the the bonus part of this. Like, oh man, I wrote this. The Air Force man is doing it as a tribute to him, and I get to conduct it. Like, holy cow! What a great present. Um, is the is the, the the better one, which is like you know we improvised together forever, and he showed me how to do that, and and I got to be you know m- m- myself amongst many many people were privy to be able to watch him write and watch his creative process as a writer, or lucky enough to be able to play his brass quintet charts, um, and um, you know if you're a student of it, look at the score and and then check out what he was doing, and uh, and then go from there. And then, you know, the best part of touring, it's just like the, I think the thing that, you know, despite his phobia of flying that went and gets about running around in a bus, you know, with the band is that, that whole Duke Ellington thing of being on the road and you can post concert, you can dissect the concert, you can play sides, you can, you know, you can transcribe. There's, there's so much that can happen when you are together. And we did a lot of time in a car 
a lot mm-hmm. of time in a car, yeah. which sounds odd for musicians to be getting things done in a car. But it was frequently after a concert. It's like, hey, man, let's let's do the first five hours of the drive tonight and sleep in. Um, so it was lots of lots. I mean, days and days and days of time like that hanging out. And um, uh, uh, so the that part is the that's the the, the bucket list compositionally, which is uh, you know. Uh, I got a tons of, of stuff that we did together, but also just the ability to know how to get free and to use things as simple as space Viking Mambo to be able to create a piece of music from, uh, is the, is the feeling of uh, gratitude, um, on the other side of his death, mm. which is, is a, is an uplifting and very nice energy, um, uh, to be in of like, Oh, well I can do this and I know how to do this. And my friend showed me how to do it. That's awesome. Um, I mean, and, 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 and in, introduce me to people that I can ask when I don't know, and not only ask because they're alive, but also ask because they're not here anymore. I can mm-hmm. dig up an Alfred Reed score or a Mahler score and take what I need to get from it to do what I want to do with music. So there's a lot of that. That's, that's, that's fun. And then there's the other part, like I'm going to New Orleans for the Jazz Educators Network Conference and Harry's coming down. We're going to play down there. And Kevin Clark, the leader of the Dukes of Dixieland, great trumpet player, um, <clears throat> is of course there. And so we're, we're playing a bunch for Gen Outreach um, and we're playing at the National Park Services Jazz Heritage Museum a couple of times. We'll be on WWOZ um, at the beginning of January. But um, that's from hanging out with Sam in the early nineties and he's running around with Vignola and then we're the three of us are in a car. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and then he's like, and then it was like, Oh, it's hot. Cause Tom Holt posted one of these pictures from my tech talking about Sam was yeah. like, was that 96 or 95? 95. And, and uh, he put, uh, played with travel and light. That was also when Carmen Miranda made an appearance, I believe on that same show. That was and, the same uh, show. Yep. Yeah, and, um, uh, uh, like that, those were the, that was the beginning of like, you know, sitting in the back of a car with Frank, frankly, quite a few times and him like, Hey man, let's just play this tune. I'm like, well, I don't know that tune. He's like, yeah, well, you'll figure it out. And, uh, um, so the, 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 the creative doors were blown off and the style doors were blown off by, uh, by those guys. And so that's the, what you're left over with is the ability to be able to go do this. You know what I mean? Like I embarked studying with Arnold Jacobs to play in an orchestra. I ended up after studying with Jim Self and Arnold Jacobs and Dan Parentoni in the president's own United States Marine band degree in finance and then finally as a 12 year old remembered that as a 12 year old harvey phillips had said you know you should be playing jazz all the time and then sitting in the car with his name he's like hey man get get your mouthpiece out we're going to work what are you doing why are you playing that f over the c chord are you deaf you know like he was saying right away so (laughs) it started in on me and then so you're on the other side you're given this the ability to you know stand on your own two feet creatively and as a craftsman uh, you know, men in the business to be able to orchestrate, right. Take any kind of projects that, that have to do with that part of the business. And then the, 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 the part that every single one of my teachers recognized, whether they taught me formally or, or informally, which was Sam, um, uh, they just simply smiled wryly and waited when I would be like, no, I'm not going to, I'm not teaching. And I, I want to be involved in teaching and blah, 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 blah. So whatever it was excuse me, that I exhibited at those early ages, they knew I was going to be a teacher. They just all kind of went, yeah, whatever, Sheridan, you'll, you'll figure it out. But that part of it, as it started to, uh, you know, f- fester, um, <laughs> did t- turn into a passion. And at, in terms of teaching, it was uh, that was another one of these great things to be able to teach with him and, and brain another, another he was coming at it from a chamber music place i was coming at it from a soloist place or he'd come at it from a writing place and i would come at it from a, an improvisation place um that that uh unique opportunity to have you know two people's pedagogies and philosophies line up enough but be different enough to make a a, a huge impact with with teachers um is extremely gratifying and so it's not sad at all to show up in a band room now um, and work breathing exercises or do some sort of groove thing or do some sort of geography where you split them apart or you make them sit close together. And, and um, it's, it's the whole 
to the end, it's like, okay, who knows who the Empire Brass is? Like, okay, well, you've got YouTube. Who knows who Ross Medvig is? Who knows who Sam Palafian is? Okay, you need to know those who that is. And then, you know what I mean? It's the... I, it's the, I remember why it's the, it's, well, I don't know. It's because we're old, right? We've reached that age where it's like, oh, well, we're the guys in the middle. We got to connect the, 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 you know, the, right. the future to the past. Yep. Yeah. And, um, uh, and, and, it, and it, it doesn't feel like a responsibility. It feels like this really, it did before. It feels this really awesome, great, very happy to, to do it and, and, and to be in, or to be given the opportunity to be the one in the middle passing the information on yeah, to being it. able to hopefully, you know, be an example of what, you know, they were, they were trying to impart, um, which was, they did for everybody. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, that's the, you know, get to talk about that. It's like, I did a, did an honor band and we talked about, I did, I did, uh, um, uh, symphonic dance number three, Fiesta, Clinton Williams, and I did the Washington Post. And so I was talking about being in the Marine Band, talking about Sousa, and talking about, uh, and then all the really great ba- band conductors who love Sousa, Fred Fennell. Oh, that was my friend Sam's uh, college band director. Oh, and by the way, when he was in uh, Florida Allstate, he did the high school premiere of this symphonic, of this piece of music, and Clifton Williams was conducting it. And he went to the University of Miami. Uh, Clifton Williams and Fred Fennell and Alfred Reed and Jerry Coker were all on his faculty, right? So in other words, like you can yeah. be doing an honor band, talking about all this stuff and can, making all this history happen. And you can see the ones that are really switched on or they're already on YouTube searching all the stuff you're talking about. And the nice thing about those YouTube algorithms offer up a playlist too. So if people get interested, they can, they can go super deep by just noticing what the algorithm is suggesting because of the nature of their search. Yep. Um, and, uh, that's, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, that makes me happy when that happens. And, uh, and, the and the, and the thing now that's very easy to process as a joyful thing that was, that was pretty sad in the beginning was the, 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 in other words, I've gone back to the April 5th and sort of gone by people's feeds who were posting very emotional and, cool stories that I didn't know, um, from before and note to then to note like how, cause I was way too emotional during all like leading up to his death. And then for many months after, uh, to notice how many of those moments of that same, like, this is when, or I remember when this happened or, you know what I mean? Like all mm-hmm. those things that we were hearing about, I, I was right. I sat right next to him for hundreds of those moments. Hmm. I, I watch those moments happen for, for, for kids over and over and over and over and for teachers over and over, like people having like the summit meeting where they're like, had every empire recording. They, you know, they, and then they like, they followed him when he went to travel and light and then they loved his playing and they loved his teaching. And then they would meet him at a clinic and they would have this moment. We all did. Right. And I would be standing right there watching them have the moment going and it'd be years into our working together. So it was just, you'd just be able to sit there and witness that happening. And I was like, oh, you know, I, I loved those moments when they were happening, but people are recalling them. It's a, it's a different type of feeling to remember those moments when you were watching people have that moment of inspiration that propelled them in, in many cases, you know, different directions in their life. Hmm. It's beautiful. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. All right. Well, we got to get out of here because I got a hard out soon and we got to do a bonus episode. But uh, you, of course, know about uh, our dear friend Jens Lindemann. And uh, oh. <laughs> there he is. There he is. Yeah. It's, uh, Warming up. Yeah, Warming up a, on the pick of little trumpet. Low register on, oh. on the pick. So what? That was his Brandenburg. What? <laughs> What what advice? What advice do you have for Jens in this uh, desperate time of need for him with his with his chops? Yeah, well, I mean, it continues, right? I mean, we all sit on the sidelines waiting for it to get better, and um, you know, patience and friendship. There's a wall at the end of that, and I think you know many of us have reached that, which is why we reach out to the friendship circle of Jens, which is really just a patience circle with that child. Right. Um, uh, <laughs> to uh to have you know external positive energy sent uh our way because you know we're really you know we, we're done with him and you're like well how can you t- that that kind of tone the way he phrases <laughs> the way he phrase i the, and i hate the, his you know, face a little, 
<laughs> the tone of his. <laughs> the little anchor tongue that makes, you know, it's like, come on. Come on. <laughs> what is that? What's that? that bilingual German stuff? I mean, what is that about? And I mean, I, you know, come on. And his face. I mean, yeah, come on. I mean, yeah. there's so, I mean, there's so much to, to cover here. Right. The acreage of right. his. <laughs> the acreage. Oh, hectares. It's just, I mean, unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. I can't even, I mean. That they haven't shut his social media accounts down by now, right? Right. Intervention. He's like a he's a walking yeah, uh, yeah violation of terms of service. <laughs> he's a walking they violation. A whole new lane for him to get in and out of Canada. Right? They have global <laughs> access. They create a trouble clef access for him. It's this little hole you have to squeeze yourself through with skinny jeans and bad shirts. <laughs> Skinny right, jeans and bad shirts is going to show us. That would be a good, uh, yep, yep. He's like a. That's his memoir, I think. Yeah, he's like a, uh, a an older, slightly more fashionable version of Lance. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, the good, you know, the upside was is that that you know there was a it, there was a momentary a, like a plateau in his descent into ineptitude when he broke his elbow. At least there was like he didn't wasn't getting worse when his elbow was broken. <laughs> There's just so much empathy from us. It's, it's, uh, yep. Pat just made himself cry. He's got to blow his nose some more. So that's right. All yeah. right. Well, I'm going to take a bite of my sorrow soup here. This is, <laughs> sorrow this, soup. this has been wonderful, Pat. I'm, I'm so glad that you and your nine digit zip code could uh, join us today. So, um, safe travels to Midwest. And, um, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for coming, man. Your check is in the mail. Yeah, well, thanks for doing this, you guys. It's uh, highly entertaining for so many people. And uh, even though I don't remember the numbers of your podcast, I do I do listen to them. And I do enjoy them. So thanks for including me as often as you include me. I appreciate it. You've enjoyed it, all five though. episodes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I may... I may have that momentum in my career may have be coming to an end today as we have revealed more today than we probably should have. However, since it's good... It's good going to air way after tomorrow yeah you're fine anyway you're it's good fine. to see you guys i wish we could do this in person sometime it'd be I nice to too. like right like actually you know like with the little like like in a restaurant like where there's like coffee glasses and shit clanking in the background yeah and, man know, the sound of bassoonists shaving their reeds in the corner so <laughs> guess what we actually have not announced this yet but uh, we are going to do a live version of this at uh, nurtech at the northeast regional tube euphonium conference uh, in ithaca in march which is going to be really fun so i don't know if we're going to broadcast it live or whether we're just going to record it live with an audience but it's going to be in the recital hall um yeah it's like the only thing scheduled at that time it's going to be good so i'm hoping that we can use that as uh cool yeah yeah it's gonna be good so anyway all right well that is gonna do it for this episode of the brass junkies You've been listening to The Brass Junkies on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to hear the bonus episode featuring today's guest, please visit patreon.com slash thebrassjunkies to learn how you can support the show and instantly access all bonus materials as well as gain access to a special patron-only Facebook group. The Brass Junkies is produced by the amazing, wonderful, and truly inspirational Will Houchen. The theme music was composed by Fernando Dados and performed by Andrew Hitz and Lance Ledoux. Duke. We are at Pray for Yens on Twitter and Instagram and have a Facebook page at facebook.com slash pray for Yens. You can find out more about the Brass Junkies and all the other Pedal Note Media podcasts at pedalnotemedia.com. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network.